Hey, how's everybody doing? Just tightening up my notes here a little bit. You can't see it, but off camera, I've got uh, prompts, books, and all kinds of stuff I'm referencing uh, here. Uh, as you look at, you know, so I'm looking at the camera. It's the same on any studio, right? You know, you look at uh, you look at a movie or anything. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, you know, they're 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 letting you see what they want you to see, but they got cameras. There's people moving around and stuff like that. Uh, you all know that. You know, Google uh, movie making from first person something and you'll you'll see all that <laughs> anyway how you doing listen we're here wrapping up um you know we'll see what's going on what i'll do with oh uh, the rest of this project we had a lot of fun we've talked about a lot of things i've come i've had an education myself as i've gone through i think now i can articulate uh just as a handful of, of fundamentals when it comes to racism in America. And uh, that's, um, I really, I'm coming away enriched. My character from completing this project is, is enriched. I've been educated and stuff. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen uh, in the future with this project. My name is Tomlin Znyback, and this again is 365 Days Toward Racial Change, day 357. You know, the racial change piece is I think, you know, it's what I think it, I'm, I desire to be what my experience is. Uh, the racial change is to, to acknowledge, come out of denial, have my eyes open on what are, are some of the things, oh, in America that have plagued me that I wasn't aware of, that I didn't understand what was, um, resistance in the system, um, uh, biases, hatred toward me out in the community. You know, uh, my eyes were uncovered for some things I didn't realize were so much a part of American life. I, I personally was not educated about some fundamentals about America. And, you know, I, I, I'm from a black family. I'm, I'm a descendant of slaves in America. You would think I, I would totally know all about the relationship between my color of my skin and the color of their skin and how America uh, treats that. So that's, uh, do you think that'd be some important aspects? I'll share a little thing with you. Um, I spent a lot of years, um, I was a bedwetter for a lot of years and for a very, an unusually long amount of years, you know, some people are liberated early on, you know, five, six years old at the latest. Well, mine was very uh, unusually long and uh, there were some issues, issues there. And, and it really did something to my life. Well, you know, it was okay. Well, it was well, never okay. How can I put this? It was as I got older and hygiene and body odor got, gets more important as we grow older. And, and, and when, when we're children, ah, it doesn't quite matter. We kind of get away with it when we're three or four years old. It's, it's cool because we, we, uh, the grown-ups in our community sees us growing out of that. Well, uh, that uh, had poor hygiene and things like that. Um, I started running into uh, some difficulties, right? Because my community, you know, had or maybe a bedwetting was behind them. 
Uh, they were up on their hygiene. And I had not been really clearly parented on a lot of things, right? You know, um, my thing was looking back in hindsight, it's like um, if bed wedding is going to be a, a part of my character, nature, experience, well, then I'm going to need to learn maybe some other skills to cope with that, you know, like, like the uh, person bound to a wheelchair, well, you need ramps now to get in the house, right? You don't sit in the wheelchair and the world doesn't demand you walk the steps if you have no use of your legs, <laughs> right? So if that wedding is going to be an issue like that, well, I need to have some skills, in which I did actually develop, but improve my hygiene and, and some other things. It's the same thing with racism. Well, what I'm getting at is this is, trying to illustrate like so many people don't understand this resistance right that there there's a so an aspect of them being soiled and it and made has nothing to do with them it's not their fault these are biases that exist in the system inherent in the system they uh these, these are uh, living uh, you know, entities that determine the course of people's lives, no matter on what side you find yourself. And you can't be in denial that these conditions exist. And you have to, to be successful, to, to turn around or to, to, to uh, self-determine your life to have some sanity well you've got to be aware you got to make some changes right but like you know like me um af after I made the changes so that I could uh, again compete and be effective in the community uh, behind my bedwetting well the bedwetting didn't stop that doesn't stop the bedwetting, but at least um, I'm engaged in some coping skills to allow me to participate in the system. I can't participate in the system if I'm soiled and dirty because people don't want to be with me, around me. Um, I've got to have some coping skills. Hey, you know, so with... You can't be in America and say that your co the color of your skin doesn't matter because that's how this nation started. On the, on the whole thing, it was black and white. <laughs> Very clear on what, what this nation was about, how it started, how it gets along, how these things still persist. Think about how you identify man, woman, Gay, straight, black, white. That's the, then we get the languages, where you're from, your socioeconomic status. America is the place where all those little intricacies uh, impact your life, mean something, determine how far you you can go, or how much energy you're going to have to put into uh, elevating yourself. Uh, it's, it's going to determine how quickly uh, you can fall through the cracks of the legal system. It's that the legal system is different for this skin color versus this skin color. And not only because of access to resources all the time. Sometimes, um, right, it's just your skin color. They got you and they're just going to move you through because uh, they know you're not going to resist. They've stereotyped you as this, so on and on, right? And, uh, you know, America is a lesser nation for that. <sighs> but since the cancer is going to be left laying there untreated, then uh, I think especially black people need to know how to navigate 
acknowledge, come out of denial, and start um, engaging the system for what it is. This, this, this racist, giant racist machine. Um, and a lot of stats to back up a lot of stuff I've said over the past year and a half. I'm prompted to do this work by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, we, we use his material a lot to inform us. And actually today we are in this book, A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. Uh, question number 24 today we are looking at. Why is there such hatred toward black people? You know, there, that's another aspect of the system. We're not loved overtly loved in america we don't resources aren't tumbling out of the sky access to uh, promotion and wealth uh is hard fought for unless we can entertain or uh, dribble a ball or something that's the truth also dr anderson wrote black labor white wealth and dr anderson's national plan to empower black america power novice you can find dr anderson at power novice Dot com here on YouTube. He's got to find behind me. You see the hashtag us two symbol. Black females supporting one another, having their communities, sharing resources. Check out Black Enough, B L A G G E N U F, and the Black Facebook experience. If you can't find your flavor, your voice here on the World Wide Web, do what I did. Start your own. Uh, you know, get it off your chest. Something's bothering you, or maybe you want to teach people something. Well, you got to perfect forum, free, you just need internet access. <sighs> um, check out, uh, if you got a business mind, entrepreneurship, uh, check out Dr. Boyce Watkins at the Black Business School, theblackbusinessschool.com. There's uh, Tyrone Gregory, self-employed tax guy, real good guy. And um, also we've gone through this book. Um, we're finished, but I've got to keep plugging this it's important to help understand racism in America, I think. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, today, like I said, this is day 357. We are in the countdown mode here. Black History Reader, uh, question 24. Why is there such hatred toward black people? Make no mistake, there's hatred out there toward black people. Um, you know, it's ancestral. These are things in the system, right? It's it's waking up with the bed, the wet bed for years and years. Well, racism is older than that. And you've got to uh, be realistic that a society that incarcerates the majority of the minority is not exercising a whole lot of altruism and love. <laughs> you know, we still got uh, aspects of Jim Crow semi-slavery going out there. You know, go, I mean, incarceration, we could do a whole year on incarceration in America. You know, I just wish, I wish black people did not participate in it <laughs> in the way that we do. I mean, we got my little drug charge on the books. Um, black hatred. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, 460 plus years of uh, hatred toward black people in America. It was sanctioned and overt, right, through slavery. And then you've got all history, you know, right up to the present. We got the coronavirus, right? The coronavirus is a big sign, pro se, is, hey, we still hate black people in America. By the way, we're sick. Uh, we got virus, the whole global pandemic, but, um, but America still hates black people. You know, uh, look who is you know most infected and impacted by the illness. It's those lower on the socioeconomic scale. It's uh, black people inhabiting that socioeconomic space is. Uh, is 
a, a reflection on America's hatred toward black people, right? Oh, but we emancipated, uh, you know, uh, we let you vote. Um, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, all these uh, things. We have hate crimes. That, it's like, dude, <laughs> if you have to employ all these resources and committees and debates, then you still hate black people. You're still wetting the bed. <laughs> when I went to bed, I had to do a lot of extra stuff to participate in the community. You still wet the bed. Right? My, my hygiene was at a whole nother level because I still wet the bed. I don't wet the bed anymore, so my hygiene is at a very simple level, <laughs> you know? If America's got to make a law to protect, to make sure I, I'm not uh, right, right, outright shot on the street like the young man in Georgia just recently, it means America still has some hatred for black people. There's a, a, a segment of the population that black people need protection from. Black hatred, still very real. <sighs> and it's sad too, you know, black, we labor, we went to war, we went to all war. You go, you go to the African-American Museum in uh, Washington, D.C., and you go to, there's a military exhibit. <laughs> oh, from the revolution, westward expansion, civil war, world wars, <laughs> Vietnam, Korea, uh, on and on, the Iraq. We're shoulder to shoulder with you. But you still have to have, you need protection and you have hate crime. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, wow, dude. <laughs> Like, America has a big blind spot to how you're, you're, we are allies on your soil and we got to work harder and you arrest us and there's drugs. Very, very disturbing about America on, on this thing, right? And I mean, it's so evident. Can't contemplate it. Um. You know, you think about uh, some of America's history. Um, 1919, year 1919, called the Red Summer. That was where there's white folks rampaging across the country, almost looking for a successful black spaces and burning and pillages. This is just a handful. I'm going to read these right out the book. This is on page 77 of a black history reader. Wilmington, North Carolina, 1899, Statesboro, Georgia, 1905, Springfield, Illinois, 1908, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, Rosewood, Florida, 1923, a movie about Rosewood, and there's a couple, there's clips here on YouTube, oh, lynchings, burnings, lives, sacking cities, um, uh, black people that rise up in the community, become successful, being uh, executed in broad daylight in the middle of town, right? You know, something's, you know, there, there's an illness, an infection. Um, there's a virus in America around black hatred, right? And it's very real. It's, it's irrational, uh, but it's very real. Very well. well, I shouldn't say irrational. The people engaged in it believe in what they're doing, have a rationale for it. Uh, it's irrational in the sense that, you know, whatever justifications they would give, then, you know, but you don't get them, you don't get them talking properly about stuff. Um it's the problem, you know, uh, it's about being stereotyped. It's about being uh, lumped in 
to the stereotype that black people are animalistic, um, hedonistic, um, too much passion and things like that. It's, it's, it's very just very sad that uh, there's segments of American society that that think we don't love our children, are incapable of uh, remaining uh, together as a family unit. You know, that we willingly, that we really want crime in our neighborhoods, right? You know, don't, don't get me wrong. The black people have some responsibility as well, and. Um, it's hard when some of the the aspects and the problems are, you know, just living out, regurgitating some issues with white control, uh, ancestral uh, attitudes from way back, right? That um, get uh, keep getting, keep reintroducing themselves in the system, you know, um, you know, what I'm seeing, uh, what I'm uh, obviously the person in line for a promotion at work, or a, a, like I just, I shared last time about my, one of my uh, plantations called me back if I want to work for them and stuff and how they were just so, how it was just so expendable. They didn't care if I came or went. <laughs> There's no no protection, no care, you know, but what um, the, the black folks that have are invested in caring and stuff like that. So, you know, these, these things exist in the system and they're, they're not going away anytime soon. In European thought, you know, some of the European thought, and, and you'll find this, you look at a dictionary, I remember this in, well, I kind of always grew up with this idea. It really was brought home when, when the movie Malcolm X, when Denzel Washington, he looks up the definition for black, the definition for white, and the definition for black is all about negativity, dirtiness, right? Uh, and it, all, all the undesirable aspects of life associated with blackness in the beauty uh, in the dictionary you know never the beauty purity right but white gets all those definitions of beauty purity cleanliness things like that we uh, we do that and defining whiteness, right? And it, it's sad. It's like, um, you know, trying to find a, a word that rhymes with orange. <laughs> the idea is, you know, language is powerful. Language is, is a story. Every word I say to you has a story associated with it. As I'm speaking, you know, um, the mind, as it pieces um, my words and sentences into coherent holes, you know, it's doing that, the, the pictures are going off in your head and, and you're associating what's going on on your electronic device with what I'm saying and my mannerisms are associated with it but you know each word has you know there's meaning and there's stories a lot of things are going on in the mind as that goes on so you know when we associate black with this stuff over here which is un negative and undesirable and we take white and be associated over here with desirability and things like that well then that um, that comes to demonstrate itself in the world. You know, now we're we're engaging the world with these associations, and it's these little 
um, mental hurdles that are we have to go over to engage the world when we're looking at someone or something black, someone or something white. Um, those stories are happening as we move in those directions. Maryland was the tip of the spear. I've talked about this a couple times, and um, it's important. Uh, Maryland was tip of the spear when when it comes to uh, black hatred, marginalization, exploitation. A lot of it began in Maryland. Uh, first thing, Maryland had this process, and it lasted for looks like oh forty. Uh, 43, 44 years, 45 years of this process of racism that went on. Uh, and Maryland's, this is documented. 1619, uh, Maryland uh, created its uh, social exclusion edict. Um, you know, just there's not going to be any association. Oh, there's still business. Um, you know, there's still maybe uh, labor, stuff like that. Nothing, nothing outright abusive yet, but you've already pointed the ship in a specific direction as far as your future relations between whites and blacks in Maryland. 19 years later, Maryland, uh, 1638, Maryland says, well, all blacks are excluded from white fruitfulness. And, and the fruitfulness, uh, you know, is, oh, the, uh, you know, doing well in business, access to wealth and resources, you know, ways to sustain your family wealth. You know, they cut black folks off, uh, you know, in a sense, essentially creating a welfare condition. To, to put the black folks in need and, you know, you marginalize them, you push them uh, to the edge, right? You've um, really set up oh, some real ethnic racial biases now. And it's very clear um, in, in writing this down and declaring it for your state that uh, white fruitfulness is not something that's going to be shared by black people. Black can pay for it, anything, you know, who knows what black people had to go through just to now feed their families, get some work, right? If, they, if they're cut off from water or um, owning land, you know, think about the, you know, encroaching on this, you know, you can probably, if you researched um, what happened with the Jews under Nazi Germany and the process of taking their rights and step by step in to outright murder and Holocaust, it'd probably be very similar to Maryland in 1638. 25 years later, 1663. Um, it was just time to put the hammer down. What the goal had been reached. Maryland decreed that all Negroes would be slaves for life. But you're all slaves. They just take you. They, you know, and they just came in and uh, took over, took control. Now this is probably uh, the the law. It's probably an affirmation of a condition that was ha probably happening. Uh, prior to actually writing it down. But now they saw it was successful. It was working. This slaves for life. Think about like, um, we got the virus now. I keep forgetting to uh, get my mask up here <laughs> to show you. <clears throat> but it's the same way, you know, when uh, they're, they're treating the black people as though it's a disease. And uh, just like the virus, you know, oh, it'd be a good idea if you wore a mask, and stuff like that, till, you know, weeks later, because of the pandemic, 
they make it law. You, know, you can't come into a store without a mask. You know, like shirts and shoes required. Uh, same flavor. Well, with um, with this laws and decrees, and edicts and things like that. With in Maryland, that's exactly what happened, right? They first they put you know probably had the social conditioning there, and then they see it works, and then they you know do a land grab on the rights of black people and put the hammer down and cut them off. Uh, two last one quick things uh, for white hatred that Dr. Anderson points out. Uh, one thing is the European idea of honor and pride. You know, uh, Europeans are used to war and fighting, right? Um, they, we had a revolution when uh, the country felt its rights were infringed upon, right? So uh, the passivity, um, the conformity of black people, uh, really um, the, the, that, um, you know, was seen as weakness and um, uh, like dogs, uh, have, when dogs are in a pack, you'll notice they see a weak dog. Well, they want to get that dog out of there. That dog can't hold its own, so they'll bite it. And so I've seen this happen. Get that dog out of there. And uh, again, that second argument for white hatred or being despised is that black people being passive. You know, the, who would let who would let allow themselves to be exploited, enslaved, let let people run over their family, take their women, and stuff like that. And that, that encourages hatred from a segment of society. Probably more, probably more, but those are those are two big pillars right there, right? I think Dr. Anderson is right on point. You know, you're, they mistake kindness for weakness and relationship with God and all this stuff. And it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a sadistic segment of society that would see that as an opportunity to further bully these people into slavery and other kind of vulnerabilities. I'm over time. My name is uh, Tomlin's Nyback. We're on the countdown. Day 357 out of the way. I'll see you next time here on Racial Change.